started, man. We're here. We're doing it. I'm here with Dr. Ian Kerner. Uh, I'm a very big fan. Uh, he has a book, She Comes First, and a bunch of other ones. He's a professional psychotherapist, sex therapist, a lot of titles, a lot of good titles, and he's done a lot of good stuff, including helping me understand uh, how to go down on a girl, honestly. And uh, it helped a lot, and I'm hoping to help more people uh, know about his book, read his book, and realize like, oh shit, this isn't that hard, and uh, to help out with their lives, truly. Um, Ian, thanks for being here, dude. Yeah, I have a question based on uh, the intro. Yeah, dude, go for it. Well, I'm just curious, you know, I, you know, so you're a guy, you're, uh, what age are you? I'm 27. You're 27. So, uh, I, the, you know, She Comes First is going on 20 years since it's been written and published uh -huh. uh, and been out there. And I'm just wondering, so you think the topic is still timely, still Hell yeah, relevant? dude. Hell yeah. <laughs> I, I, as much as, uh, I think I saw online that, that you're, um, it's been translated into what? How many languages? Like a dozen languages. A dozen? <laughs> you know what? It needs to be translated into every language and also <laughs> like gifted because I still think there's a lot of, there's a weird stigma with it with dudes, which I'm not really sure why where it comes from uh but it seems to be everywhere there seems to be something thought of as like unmanly about it and it's i mean still even with my friends dude i'll sometimes there's been there's been conversations where uh we've been talking and i've talked about how like i've had a hook up with with someone just like a one or two time thing and i'll mention how i went down on them and they're like dude you barely know her and then in the same sentence they'll be like but did she suck your dick and i'm like dude that's like it's wow. <laughs> yeah yeah i know i asked because you know um i wrote the book a long time ago and there's now there's been the explosion of like the internet and mm -hmm. digital videos and social media and so much more awareness around sexuality so i was just wondering if you know, the topic was still as timely as certainly when I wrote the book, you know? Yeah, I, I uh, what what made you want to write the book? Well, wow, man, if I go back, there's a personal story and there's a professional story. Let's hear, honestly, both of them. But I want to okay. hear the personal one for sure okay. first. Yeah, you know, the personal story is that my whole adult and young adult sexual life I had suffered pretty badly from sexual dysfunction, mm -hmm. namely premature ejaculation often gets called early ejaculation nice. these days. But um, yeah, I really, I really struggled and suffered with that. And I thought I was sort of like living alone in a vacuum. I didn't realize what an immense issue it was until I started becoming a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. So I started reading research and I learned that even more than erectile disorder or erectile impairment, whatever you want to, whatever term you want to use, that early ejaculation was one of the most common issues that men faced. But when I was growing up, man, it was like, you know, I'm in my 50s. This is yeah. going back to the 70s and the 80s. Like, there was no internet. There were no, yeah, there was yeah, no yeah. men's health magazine. There was like the Alfred Kinsey report yeah. from the 40s. Like, All you could you know? do is talk to your friends about it, and then they would just be like, oh, they yeah. would just and lie like, and say, no, dude, there's something wrong with you. I never come quick. And you're like, okay. Right. And like, I'm going to talk to my friends in like the early 80s about early ejaculation. No fucking way. Hell no. And of course, you're not talking to women about it, and you're not talking to your parents about it. No. Not oh, dude, I'd care. rather I'd rather come quickly for the rest of my life than talk to my dad about coming quick. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, for me, you know, I know early ejaculation, it's often like a gag or a joke mm -hmm. in movies. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. the button on a joke. The guy's like, oh, uh, no. But, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like for most men I work with and certainly for me, it was a chronic persistent problem. And so I just couldn't use my penis the way I wanted to. Yeah. And so I felt. You know, I, I felt really depressed and bummed out that and sucks. stopped dating at one point. And so really, way before becoming a sex therapist, way before writing She Comes First, my personal journey to becoming sexually healthy, to being able to make love, was to shift really from this idea of intercourse as the main event to, to outer course. Uh, and nice. in doing so... 
like, listen, if, if I had just been a guy with a problem writing about a problem, I don't think I would have like tapped any kind of universal nerve, but really in shifting from intercourse to outer course, mm -hmm. manual stimulation, oral stimulation, what it really taught me and I learned firsthand power and centrality of clitoral stimulation mm -hmm. in making love to a female partner. And so I kind of went from being ill clitorate to clitorate. Oh yeah, ill clitorate. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. Yeah, that's you made up that term, right? In the in the book, I made up that term. I think you got a Back few terms you made up with. Yeah, I can't believe it's <laughs> twenty years ago. Damn. So you can't. Wow. You can't, so like two thousand around the two thousand. You you wrote is this. when I probably started thinking about the book. I think I I think it, it published two thousand and four. Okay. May of two thousand and four was the official publication. But that's when it first started. Was there like a certain instance? Uh, because I, I, from the time I became sexually active, have had issues with both being premature and also just having straight up like ED. Um, right. And it's just not working, getting in my head. And then it's this vicious cycle where like where it starts and begins, it then just plays on each other. That record gets, it gets deeper and yeah. deeper, kind of like filled into it. And so I was always like, what's wrong with me? How am I going to get past this? What do I have to use to figure it out? And But was there like a one moment where you had a, a particularly bad experience where you're like, dude, I got to figure out something else? Or was it just like the, the combination is being compounded? I think it was just multiple yeah. issues and trying to hide it and lie about it and make up excuses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, it just became a constant source of rumination and I couldn't get it out of my head. What's interesting though is your generation, I feel like your generation suffers much more from uh, erectile disorder, psychological erectile Definitely. unpredictability than my generation. Like um, back then ED was usually much more of an organic nature for older men. Yeah. And your generation, I mean, I see a lot of guys your age and younger Really, psychological ED is probably the number one issue. Oh, yeah, dude. I, I know that because I talk about it and I've mentioned how I've taken like PED. I'll take them. I call them PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. Uh, you know, like, yes. but for I've taken those and then you would be so surprised by how many dudes will text me like, yo, where'd you get that, by the way? Like, can I have a couple? Da, da, da. It's like, like dudes are dealing with this, whether it's. Because of porn, whether it's because of them just being in their head, or I, there's so many yeah. reasons why. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think porn is secondary. Okay. Uh, I think porn is secondary to the primary issue being nervousness, uh, performance anxiety, a sense of expectations. I think men sometimes blame it on porn yeah. because men watch a lot of porn and masturbate a lot. And they're able to get erections and ejaculate via mm -hmm. porn without a problem. So then they have the issue with real sex and they sort of say, well, maybe the issue is that I'm overdoing it with porn. But I think really, really masturbation and porn are kind of pressure free and easy. That's and what so I think it, it is. Sense. It's like when you're – yeah, if you're jacking off or you're – you're just completely calm. No one's watching you. There's no expectations. You get to like just do what you like. And also, I mean, I've always kind of thought the whole getting nervous and leading to ED and stuff like that is because uh, your sympathetic nervous system is being activated when in reality your like parasympathetic needs to be more alive for you to be able to. Totally. Right? Yeah. Dylan, give me one second. I'm really sorry here. I got an emergency text from my teenage son. Go ahead. No worries. He money on his credit card. Oh, God. Okay. That is important. Man. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's go for it. It's an emergency. Can I curse on your show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, dude. Of course. It's an emergency for him. <laughs> <laughs> He's texting me. Dad, He's I need money. Me. Why do I have this stupid credit card? He's threatening you. Call? Good. That's a good son. You know what? I remember when I was a teenager uh, around the time that I really started to just threaten my dad continuously. And I haven't stopped, you know? Yeah. I'm saying we'll talk later. Yeah. You can get a job, though. Oh, <laughs> yes, dude. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's so good. I mean, my dad still does that now. 
It's you okay. Can... I am working, but it's okay. Yeah. He's sorry. Now. He's sorry because I said get a job. I mean, he's like, you're right, Dad, but just help me out, you know? <laughs> All right, man. Sorry about that. That's good. That's no worries. I remember my my uh, when I was in college, I I had a I had a credit card that my dad allowed me to use, but it wasn't like a you use this anywhere. It was like you use this. Hold on, let's pause for a second. It was like you use this for books, and then if you're like out of money, or like if you need food, you can use this. But he always was like, I can't wait to cut that card up. As soon as yeah. blah, 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 I'm going to cut it off anytime. He just loved holding that shit over my head and just being like, you got to work more. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. You go very quickly from being the son to the dad and yeah. you start understanding both sides. You know? Oh, I understand it a lot more. How old uh, and what age range is your son? Uh, I have two sons. They're 17 and 14. Interesting. And see, and the charge just came up, and it wasn't even for food. It was for a convenience store, and I know he's buying, like, a fucking vape pen. Oh, he's some, buying a jewel! And some THC cartridge illicitly or something. Oh, my so God. So here I am, not even being hassled for food. I'm probably being hassled. You're being, dude, you're spot. being hustled for some THC and, and dopamine is what you're being hustled for. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, we'll get back to what we were talking about, but but having, I mean, having two two sons as a, as a therapist and psychotherapist and who are teenagers, it must be kind of an interesting dynamic because one, you remember being um, a teenager, but now that you've studied and gotten like, is it hard to to try to not psychoanalyze your kids when what they're going no. through? No, I don't want to deal with my kids when I get home. <laughs> I don't want to psychoanalyze them. I don't want to get into their heads. I don't mean them like sitting down on the on the couch, but if they're complaining to you about some shit or or you see like you're like, oh, this one's been very uh, he's been he's been a, a lot more aggressive recently. Like, I wonder what's going on. Well, yeah, I yeah. have tons of behavioral issues. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, like I could probably diagnose between both my sons. I could probably throw out their bipolar, schizophrenic, <laughs> personality, oppositional disorder, you name oppositional it. Oppositional disorder for sure. <laughs> no, they're 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 good. They're good kids. They're just trying to to get by and uh yeah. um you know we have a very you know like part of like part of the whole thing is maintaining a sex positive home. That's good. Uh, that starts with really my relationship with my wife and, yeah. you know, being sex positive and, um, mm. you know, the older one is bringing his girlfriend home right now and, yeah. uh, bring her over. So it's, it's a lot of, how did adapting. you, how did you, uh, cause you, you had your two kids and you had them with your wife. How did you guys talk about the, I don't want to call it right because everyone has their way of raising a child, but the way that you wanted to raise your kids around sex and being able to talk about it in what you think is the most positive, uh, beneficial way. Yeah. I don't know that we ever sat down and really figured it out. I mean, I, I, I find that most people grow up in one of three kinds of home environments, mm -hmm. either a sex positive environment where sexuality and curiosity and masturbation mm -hmm. and experimentation and communication are embraced. Yeah. That was not the home that I grew up in. Me I grew up in this, <laughs> the second type of home, which is more what I would call sex evasive. Mm -hmm. just doesn't get talked about yeah. at all. Yep. It's like sex vacuum. Um, and then the third environment would be sex negative yeah, where yeah, yeah. people are subject to shame and guilt and really negative messages catholicism yeah yes, yeah all that all that good stuff yeah i think i was more sex evasive um and it's 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 so interesting how we're like because i mean my household like violence was openly shown and talked about and it's like especially in american culture it's like violence is completely accepted but then talking about sex which is again like another because to me it's like there's all this violent porn which people are okay with watching but then actual porn no one wants to talk about that right you know what do you mean by violence porn you just mean like video games and i mean stuff like 
I, I don't know how I feel about video games being sh like, actually, you know what? Yes. Uh, even though I don't know, I don't think video games are necessarily bad. There are, there are video games that I play now where you see a guy's head like almost explode right. and that's completely okay. And there's also, you know, now there's all these websites, World Star Hip Hop, Hood Site, all this shit where you can see someone actually be murdered by the cartel or you can see someone get into a freak accident and half their face is fucked up or like there's a lot of weird i've seen a lot of bad shit you know but for whatever reason like if i talked to like if i had that video and showed my pops he'd probably be much more okay or be like dylan you probably shouldn't watch that but if i was like oh yo let's talk about whatever he'd most people yeah. would much rather talk about violence and I, I i'm curious why we as a society are more comfortable with violence i think than sex well i mean i don't know that i have the answer it's a it's it's a big question and certainly not. when you compare you know the violence uh, and obscenity of just you know our daily news cycle and what we have to experience and you compare that to porn you do wonder like um, why are we coming out so strongly against porn? All I can really say is that, you know, um, really going back to uh, the birth of Christianity, <clears throat> especially with um, um, St. Augustine, that there's been a, a huge agenda uh, to, to, to vilify any form of um, premarital sex any kind of sex that's non-procreative. I mean, mm -hmm. the first model of sex in the Christian era that was really espoused yeah. was purely procreative sex. Okay. Sex, the missionary position was designed to be as pleasureless and as procreative <laughs> as possible, right? That was yeah. the emphasis. Priests were the ideal, you know, just don't have sex at all. Yes. But if you do have to have sex, it better be procreative. It better be married sex, and it should be as pleasureless as possible. Which, it's only over time that we started to um, enshrine relational, romantic sex, recreational mm -hmm. sex, and so I think like all of the um, criticism against porn is really just going back to sex negativity. Okay, to a certain do. You, do so that partially could have probably also been a reaction to Christianity comes up and they're like, okay, we need to form this religion. Right. And they are, they're forming it. They're, they're writing it. They're basing off of everything. And they probably want to differentiate themselves from the other, which they seem as the, the pagans, the people that are having the enjoyable sex. That so they're just like, okay, let's do the opposite. That's all wrong. The only way to do it. Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, you're totally right. Like pre-Christian sex, whether you're looking at, uh, you know, classical Greece, mm -hmm. Roman culture, Hebraic culture was all much more sex open and sex positive. It wasn't even so much Christ. I mean, Christ said very little about sex except yeah. in criticizing adultery. It was really one dude saint augustine yeah uh, okay who is really so messed up about his own sexual see i shouldn't even go here because what's going to happen is this is going to get posted and no this like, is great this is great i'm gonna get shot you know no way dude yeah i always get, i always get crucified by the right by the fox news do you really Trump. yeah why do you think yeah. that is because you're so open about it um because i write for cnn okay that's why CNN in a very sex positive way yeah that's why and um, like, for example, I was covering a, a research study on cuckolding as a sexual fantasy uh -huh. and how it's a positive sexual fantasy. You think and so? Like, what's that? You think Do so? I think so? I was actually just quoting the research, which oh, shows that it's a okay. very popular sexual fantasy, not even necessarily to enact, just to fantasize about mm -hmm. the idea of men watching their wives having sex with someone else. So interesting uh, because I remember I had that fan not fantasy but I had that thought once with an ex and it made me um viscerally angry and like I wanted to commit a crime. <laughs> so Cuz you had the fantasy? I didn't you like fantasize like I liked it but I thought about like I I remember I saw a dude who it's so dumb how your brain works especially as like a eat like a testosterone ridden like egotistical dude i saw some other guy that i thought i was like yeah my girlfriend would want to hook up with that dude and it made me like angry and by the way she probably wasn't into that guy 
Right. That was probably right. my weird attraction to that dude. But instead, I was like, right. nah, she wants to fuck that dude. Th that makes right. me mad. Right, right. No, I hear you. So it's a popular fantasy, and uh, a lot of couples actually enjoy enacting it, but a mm -hmm. lot of people like fantasizing it. I was just writing about a study, yeah. and Fox went crazy, and Tucker Carlson went crazy. I must have gotten hundreds of emails about, like, I'm going to come and cuckold your wife while you <laughs> I'm going to come fuck your wife, bro. It's like, no, you're not. So I'm always, like, loathe. <laughs> wow, that's uh, It's always so crazy to me, these people that write emails, that, like, take the time out to find your email and are like, oh, this guy thinks, this guy thinks I should watch my wife fuck someone else. I'm going to. Tell him that I'm going to fly to New York and then fuck his <laughs> wife. And then he's, I guess, by that logic, going to like it. So then I'm helping him. Right. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, I think you must be Jewish, too. <laughs> so I'm going to like doubly fuck your wife because you're Jewish. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to fuck your Jewish wife. And that's, that's going to show that will show that you're the you're the Jew that's been hiding. It's like, oh, my God, right. dude. Wow. Oh, that's, um, that's, that's, that is, I mean, yeah, you're just like writing about these, I, I, I'm, why do you think it's more prevalent now? Do you think maybe because my, our generation doesn't give a fuck about marriage as much before or people are more open to. Well, what's the question? Dylan? Like, like, why do you, cause you were saying that you were researching about, or, or, um, Reporting on reporting a research, on a research stuff, yeah. You know, that had come out because I try and stay, you know, I write for CNN yeah. every now and then. I try and stay abreast of the latest research. And, um, you know, I mean, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that we have moved, you know, away from a purely procreative model mm -hmm. to one that's much more relational and finally to one that's like recreational. And I think yeah. part of the problem in our society is that we don't embrace... Uh, the recreational aspects as much as the relational. We're all about mated pair bonding, love making within a couple. And mm -hmm. listen, I'm married for 20 plus years. I'm all about love making within a couple, but we also have these wild sexual imaginations. Urges, yeah. Have to indulge and we want to keep sex interesting. Otherwise, we're just going to end up, you know, cheating. Cheating or being unhappy. You know? And listen, and there's nothing wrong with being non-monogamous unless your stated value is to be monogamous. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't do the thing after where you're like, I thought we were open. Like, yeah, because that's, <laughs> that's the, the being a liar. Um, but, uh, but let's go back to oral sex. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's a, my favorite. All this political stuff just tires me out these oh, days. Oh, does it? And, oh, it's so interesting for me to just be like, let's... Yeah. Let's you want to talk about like Augustine and how he struggled with his own sex addiction. And, uh, yes. Yes. I want to talk about to all view, of that shit. And then came to a view that really was like um, so shame based, you know, I think people are just feel shame over really liking things half the time. And I don't know if that's a human emotion or that's taught, but it is something where like, why would he all of a sudden be like, do you, like, I mean, do you find that with people that you've treated? Like, what do you think is this basis of shame in people around things like that? Well, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's like, you know, you're born, you're a kid, and for a little while we were a kid, you kind of get to make believe and use your imagination and kind of have playtime. And then almost immediately, as of like kindergarten, work begins, whether it's the mm -hmm. work of learning to count or learning to read and play, true play becomes secondary to work. And, yes. Or play is organized as a form of sport, you know, but that, mm -hmm. that totally just unbridled creative imaginative play is never really nurtured. In fact, it's really stamped out. And so I think it's more like our, the playful parts of our sexuality never even get language. They never get exercise. They never even learn words, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're right. They, they're, they're not um, nurtured and allowed to grow. 
and people aren't eating. And so then, you know, and so then as a result, you grow up with like this part of yourself. Well, it was like me back when I was like 18 and 19, like Mm -hmm. totally interested in being sexual, totally interested in intense erotic experiences and not even being able to open my mouth to talk about the sex. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you couldn't. um, You couldn't talk about it. And I think a lot of people probably feel that which leads them towards. I don't know. This has been a thought that I have like. There's all this talk about kinks now and people being kink positive and like allowing you to do whatever. And part of me thinks some of those, some of those are just things you like, you know, like you just realize for a reason, like, oh, this thing kind of excites me. But I've also kind of thought as they get crazier and more open, part of me thinks people still kind of want sex to be wrong. So they need to like find something that is maybe exciting or taboo about it by adding all of those. And and I will say this is coming from a biased perspective of someone who I've never really had anything kinky that I liked. I've, it, like for me, because maybe I've had at least one parent that was more open about it and no one that ever shamed <laughs> me, I was always like, look, I like having sex. I, I like recreation, recreationally having sex with different people, but there's nothing ever they need to do that's insane in it. I just like to... I don't know, at least like the person most of the time, because if not, it can get kind of boring. But it seems people are like always pushing for some kind of taboo in it. Right. Well, you know, Dylan, again, if on the subject that we've been talking about, Mm -hmm. if you say to yourself, well, the standard has been a very sort of constricted, procreative sex. Yeah. That that's sort of the thing that's always been held out that always stands in contrast to the wildness and quirkiness of our individual imaginations. I think if we really could live without shame and without taboo, our sexual imaginations, the relationships we structured, Mm -hmm. they'd probably be a lot less constrained. And I think so. I think almost any kind of sex that's non-traditional has a taboo quality. And to me, we'll never live in this world, but I'm very curious if we lived in a world without all of these constrictions and taboos, yeah. what kind of sexual people would we actually be? We might be much more um, fluid, much more perverse, much mm-hmm. more open, you know? I Or do you think because everything was open and like normalized or allowed, we would kind of have maybe phases or get through it. And then we'd be like, ah, oh, you know, I, I, I did that. And now it's kind of, it's not a direct one-on-one argument, but it's like the, the difference between letting a child start to taste wine at 12 or 13, like, you know, they, they do in Europe or in America where we just binge at 18 and black out for five years, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I, I I agree with that. I mean, to me, like, um, yeah, you said, like, what's the power of a taboo? Well, I think the power of the way taboos get used, kink gets used in some cases, is because we are trying to keep it sex exciting. We're trying to create, you know, peak sexual experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I think we'd be capable of creating peak sexual experiences and engage in behaviors like submission and domination and voyeurism and exhibitionism Mm -hmm. and oral sex and masturbation and mutual masturbation and watching porn together. I think there's capacity to still enjoy all of these things without them, unfortunately, getting put in the bucket of having to be taboos. Yeah. And I I think if they were more, I think what's interesting is that for someone like me, who's on one side of that spectrum where I'm at least for now, not very interested in any of that, you almost feel like, what's up with me that I don't want to do any of those? At least for me as a millennial dude who's 27, like a lot of guys or a lot of people you hear about, oh, I'm doing this and then and then yeah. whips and mutual. Yeah. yeah, and you're like, well, what if I just like being with one person and enjoying yeah. it and we both like, calm, yeah. dude. You know... 
sexuality and typical sexuality occurs across such a spectrum. Like yeah. I relate to what you, what you're saying, which is I like feeling personally attached to the person I'm having sex with. hundred um, percent. I'm very sensually oriented. I get very involved in like mm -hmm. the sensual experience of my wife's body and the way she smells and mm -hmm. tastes. And like, that's all yeah. really a turn on for me. Um, but a lot of people are more psychologically oriented in how they get aroused. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. some people enjoy the sensual, but the thing that really turns them on is some kind of a uh, fantasy or some kind of like, you know, psychological experience. So I just think the ways in which we mm -hmm. get aroused are different and we all have capacities to get aroused in different ways. Like sometimes I will really enjoy the psychological yeah. or the kink or something that feels a little fetish based like yes. but i think my dominant sexual style and personality uh -oh. is rude based um sensual approach yeah and i think it might be at least to a certain degree split along some kind of gender lines because i feel like from the women that i've talked to uh, some kind of story or an imagination kind of helps them a lot more than men who are very visual oriented or orientated. Yeah. I don't know which is the right word, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. which I think is always interesting. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, men in my experience, and this is a generality and I hate to speak in generalities, but just to be a little general, I Let's think be general. men often are, uh, able to experience what would be called spontaneous desire, where they're able to um, see something sexy, notice something sexy, oh, yeah. think of something sexy and metabolize that sexual cue very quickly uh -huh. into a sense of desire yes. that they can act upon, right? So it's like a highly reactive, spontaneous kind of feeling of desire. Very reactive. And, and studies have shown that women... Um, tend to experience more of a percolation of sexual cues mm -hmm. that women can notice things that are sexy, experience things that are sexy, but it doesn't always lead to that same immediate desire to have sex. Yeah. And so part of that percolation of sexual cues might mean like, um, engaging your sexual imagination, not only so that you can get turned on, but so that you can also turn off the things that are getting in the way. Yeah, your mind. Right? Like imagine, like you said, well, you suffered from um, erectile. I still do, dude. Yeah. yeah. You still do. Yeah. Right? Because your mind, what? Your mind gets too involved in your... You think about this. You think, am I really into this? Is it going to happen again? Like, what are they going to... Th All that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, an, it's an anxiety running in the background. Right. And do you ever think about stuff a little bit outside of the bedroom? Like, what about my job or my work? You know, the, the job or the other stuff doesn't come out. You know what I think a lot of times does come into at least my mindset is unless you're really – and I, I found this with um, – when you're uh, hooking up with people casually. And I think this happens more, especially with – I'm, I'm very for the apps, but I think people need to, like, think about how they use that software – because it can lead to, I think, a lot of pitfalls. But a lot of times you're in it, and I think unless you're very, very attracted to that person, there's a lot, there's spark, there's intensity, there's a, um, a your, like your full attention is on them, you'll start to get distracted and think, what am I even really doing here? Am I really even, like, that That will start to play in, in the background for me because it's, it's, I'm not fully engrossed in that person, you know? Right. But because so, of hookup culture, sorry, you think like, well, I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be having fun. Like, yeah, everyone says like, let's have fun. And you go, okay, well, what if I'm like, I'm not even really feeling this. Right. So you, you sort of come across a little bit of like cultural and existential anxiety. Like what's the purpose of mm -hmm. this? What is this all about? And that starts running through your head as kind of a you know, a, a stream of thought, what do you do then? And, and that stream of thought, that anxiety um, can shut down your erections, right? I guess at some point, do you start to panic a little bit? Am I going to get erect? Or? For sure. hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You panic right. or you go like, what happens if this does lead to that? Because you might feel how the date is going 
and you go, damn, if this leads to that, like, am I even really gonna, it's, yeah, you start, you start living in the future, which is what anxiety is, you know? Right. And as soon as your body picks up anxiety, Mm -hmm. even, even small levels of anxiety, it starts to shift into that sort of panic based fight or flight. Sympathetic. Yeah. Yeah. And so blood sort of capillaries in penis and, and, and arteries into the penis start to close. Mm -hmm. Blood starts to redirect towards your feet for, for flight or Mm -hmm. your hands for fight. And, and that adrenaline response, I mean, adrenaline is really, the enemy of erection, yeah. you know? Which so sucks because I love gonna, adrenaline. Right. Yeah. Right. So what are you going to do to sort of stop that panic response? Um, you know, I've thought about uh, there are things you can do. There are like breathing exercises you can do that can take your body from sympathetic to parasympathetic, which sometimes helps, but it's also so hard to like when you're with someone to be like, all right, I'm listening to them and also – let me do some box breathing where I'm four in, hold, four out. I I mean, it's it's really trying to – the only thing I've seen help is trying to let it – trying to let that record run, kind of completely let it run its course because, you know, thoughts are going to go and if you latch onto them, you can stay with them. But if you kind of let them just pass by – to a certain degree, they, a lot of times they can, uh, extinguish themselves and then trying to focus on that person as, as much as you can. But I mean, I will admit sometimes you're there and you're like, this probably isn't going to work out, but I don't know. I've talked about this before, but like, as a dude, you're like, well, I'm already here. Like I need to do this as a man. And right. Right. So I find like, I think you're really right, Dylan. And I find like um, I find like a lot of guys like because the emphasis is really on intercourse, mm-hmm. they don't give themselves a long enough outer course runway. They don't give themselves enough time to really generate that arousal to really distract themselves yeah. from that record that's running around in their head. So you know, definitely like really getting curious and interested in near experience to mm-hmm. the person and the body and the soul that you're generating pleasure with. But I think that's also where psychological stimulation can be really powerful, which comes back to what you said was a difference between that you've observed between men and women, that women often seem to focus on some kind of story Mm -hmm. or some kind of fantasy. Well, if you as a guy could distract yourself from your own anxieties through fantasy and through... Um, that might be a, a powerful way of, of getting aroused of helping. Yeah. Right? And, but I, uh, I think also a lot of times it can mean that it, I think it depends where you are, like in your life for like, for dudes out there that are potentially dealing with this, I think it also might mean maybe you're done doing the casual thing and maybe what your body or your mind is trying to tell you is like, yo, you're trying to find someone that you're really into because if not, part of you doesn't even feel like it's fully worth your time, you know? And there are like these underlying like psychological motivations that you might not even be aware of or feelings that, because sometimes I feel like our, our mind or what is, because there's a difference between the brain and the mind. I think our brain notices something about our mind and how we're feeling and like makes a decision before we're fully aware of it. Some people might call it subconscious, whatever you want to do, but you have to then realize like, oh shit, I, this is, it's when people go like, oh, this isn't what I want. And I didn't know, or my gut, (laughs) all those different reactions. It's like when you aren't in tune with that, that's when you make these decisions that you go, I don't even know why I'm doing this. Yeah. 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 And I think during sex, like not only allowing yourself to communicate so that you're creating like a feedback loop, but really allowing yourself to get um, rhythmically connected and rhythmically in sync with someone. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, so I think, uh, you know, I think everything that you're talking about that you're experiencing uh, with your brain and mind and body Mm -hmm. makes sex even more challenging because you got to get in sync and in tune with somebody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which 
I think it's harder now because we're not even in sync with ourselves. So how are we going to get in sync with someone else? You had said uh, earlier about um, like the different types of, because like pe- like people are cheating and there's like different types of sexual uh, urges that you have like in a relationship. And I kind of wanted to just talk about more. Do you think there's a point in your relationship where, because I've talked to like many dudes who I'm friends with who they're all in relationships and they'll go, oh, I still, you know, I saw this girl and I still wanted to like, basically dudes in relationships after like three or four years, they like get this itch to like, I would like to have sex with someone else. And I think a lot of them feel bad about it. They feel shame or whatever. And I've always said, I don't think that's going to ever go away. Because I think that's just, there's this like procreation urge in you that's always going to just pop up. But like, how do you deal with that as someone that said, I am in a relationship, I'm committed to this. I know like logically this is what I want to be doing, but then there are these primal urges that are going to come up that I shouldn't deny, but also kind of move past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's hard, right? Like if as a dude, you're in a spontaneous desire framework, Mm -hmm. right? Like all your life, looking back to your first observations about your own sexuality, Mm -hmm. you've noticed sexual cues and things about the person you're attracted, the type of person you're attracted to has turned you on, right? Like that becomes your framework and it's kind of nuts if you're in a relationship with someone who used to be able to turn you on like that Mm -hmm. in the beginning, the dudes that you're describing. Yeah. And now four years in, they still feel spontaneous desire when they're out in the world, that highly reactive desire, but they don't anymore when they're at home. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that becomes a, a bigger philosophical or existential challenge. Like, what's wrong? Is it, is it, is it the relationship? Is it, Mm -hmm. is it me? Like, why do I not feel like myself anymore, you know, in this, in this relationship? Uh, and, and you're right. What if that's a natural sort of passage? That's like a natural progression and, and shift. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the fact that out in the world or out on the internet, you're still like this total, dude who responds to you know sexual cues with this physical feeling this physical call to act it's a big challenge right yeah it's like there's a difference between the the initial lust that you maybe have for someone when you're first or with them that then changes to i can't remember if you wrote about this in your book but i've definitely read it where there's there's the switch from short-term to long-term love and they're different (laughs) types of love and you, you should not expect to have both all the time because they they kind of do different things. Like one, almost, if you want to look at it just like evolutionarily or biologically, like one is, oh, as a dude, got to just procreate, keep the, keep the species going. And another one is, oh, I'm deciding to pair bond with this person right. and, and at least raise kids for until they're viable. I don't know, 15, 16, eight, I mean, 18 in our society, but you know. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Helen Fisher writes, I write about it a little bit, but Mm -hmm. really the person who influences me is Helen Fisher is the first person that comes to mind. She wrote about like sort of there being three brain systems that sort of come Uh together to form romantic love. The first would in a man, especially, but in a woman too, would be a testosterone based seeking system. Like, oh, that person turns me on. I'm attracted to that person. Let me go sleep with that person or try to pursue that person. I slept with that person. It's not really love at first sight or it's not my thing. Or we went on a few dates and I don't feel. Yes, dude, that happens and you feel bad about it. Right. Well, that's your, that's the seeking system of your brain Uh being operationalized. I mean, you got to seek, right? You got to be able to like seek and discard. I hate to use that word. Like seek, discard, discard, right? Like, but that's, that's what we're doing. We are seeking. Mm -hmm. Now then what's interesting, and that's a very testosterone based approach. Then what's interesting though, is sometimes somebody gets through, right? Like, holy shit, I really want to see this person again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually thinking like, where are they? 
who are they with? What are they doing right now? Why are they not with me? Like, what if they're with somebody else? Like, I want to hold and merge and be with this person for a much longer period of time. That's a different brain system that's operating. Oh. And that's now, um, you know, a brain system that um, Helen Fisher might call it like the limerence system or a more romantic love system or an infatuation system, but it's certainly more dopamine driven. Mm -hmm. um, um, and suddenly like we're not seeking the world, we're just seeking one person. And it feels that addictive because of that dopamine, yeah. dopamine, jergic, whatever the hell you call yeah, it. Yeah, whatever, whatever it is, but we've shifted from seeking the generality of a partner in the world to really just seeking one person that we can name and identify. And, and that's a kind of, that's sort of that infatuation system that in my experience does last for a couple of years, two mm -hmm. or three years even, you know? And, and meanwhile, you're moving into a different brain system, which is much more of an attachment-based system, where we are creating the long-term attachments to potentially create this, you know, pair bond. I mean, this is murky. Pretty many gay and lesbian patients who have no, who don't have the same procreative agendas uh, mm -hmm. and are still creating very rich, long monogamous relationships so it's really hard yeah. to just use gender biology or evolution but um you know speaking as one person who's been married for you know 20 plus years you know a i did something that a lot of my patients don't always do which is one of the main factors in which i picked my wife mm -hmm. and i think she picked me had a lot to do with sexual chemistry had a lot to do with i think it's helpful sexual attraction, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of my patients sort of say it wasn't that strong in the beginning, or I thought it might develop, or that, this person was really I think more it's of my best friend. Yeah. Not for everyone, but I, I think, I think that's just what you did, at least for me, I think is what's going to be the same thing because when it's not there, you're just like, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it's, it feels like a big part of the relationship. Maybe not for everyone. Maybe if someone, for whatever reason, their sex drive is like not that high. But for you, you're saying it was a big part and that's probably helped, you think, make it last. Well, it was a huge part that I really, it wasn't the, now listen, prior to my wife, mm -hmm. I'd been in relationships that were totally sexually driven, where everything yes. about the choice was just based just on this person she's hot. so hot. Yeah. <laughs> Her tits, dude. Um, That's why we're in this. Yeah. And, you know, that didn't end up. No way. To the long term. But you can't. But see, what happens to a lot of people, men and women, is they sort of say, oh, I had all these initial sexual things that didn't work out. Mm -hmm. So clearly I shouldn't be selecting or picking just for the sex piece. Let me go for some other relational quality mm -hmm. in this partner and they sort of forget about the sex part yeah which is probably why a lot of marriages or or long-term relationships you might see they're not having as much sex but it's because they they chose for other factors that may, they, they maybe thought were more huh. important to them yeah i think that that's part of it and then you know the other thing dylan is so once you have picked a partner who can be both great on a relational level and you also have a ton of sexual attraction to, mm -hmm. um, how do you keep that sexual attraction nurtured? And yeah. Bring it back why? to what you we were saying in the beginning. Like if it starts to fall off, does that mean you're no longer in, in it? Does that mean that there's something going on in your life that you're not, uh, facing or like, what's the way to, I mean, people say keep the spark going, but is there anything that you've noticed that's helped you to at least reignite it at certain times in your life? Yeah. And, and you're right to use the word reignite because, you know, if you really want to have a lot, I guess talking to you individually, it sounds like your goal is to have a long-term partner to mm -hmm. eventually be married, to, to maybe sure. have kids down the line. Hell yeah. Uh, have a family and the idea that hopefully you'll stay together for what constitutes a lifetime. Yeah. I had, I, had, I come from parents that are divorced. So I'm like, really don't want to do that. 
Um, yeah. Even though I'm happy that they got divorced because it was for the best, and now they're happier with their second partners, I'm still like, it'd be nicer to, to get it on the first time. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. Know? No, no. I, I really, um, you know, I really respect that. And I will say that life will throw so many obstacles at you. Like I think of just myself raising these two sons mm -hmm. and really one of them has, you know, some psychological issues. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I, I mean, we probably disagree on so many things at any different time. There has to be so much compromise and negotiation across so many domains of life. And I'm so glad that we have this core sexual attraction and uh. pleasure that we can sort of drop into. It really creates a constant reserve of positivity mm -hmm. and positive intentionality. Um, how do we maintain that, man? Well, first of all, now you can imagine as somebody that struggled my whole life with early ejaculation mm -hmm. and has always been working on improving from that point, right? If I had a partner who is just purely intercourse focused or who wasn't open to oral sex and, You'd be and fucked. outer parts, right? Yeah. Right? So it's like not just having sexual chemistry with my wife. It's about being engaged in the sexual behaviors and a kind of a sexual environment that we can both extrapolate tremendous pleasure from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely very helpful. I think, um, I mean, we, we, we move so far past this, but like, why do you think there's such a taboo with, uh, guys going down? Because to bring it back to the, the reason I even discovered yeah. you. So she comes first was my girlfriend at the time, like, I don't know, seven years ago, she recommended that we get it. We got it. We started reading it together. Um, and I'm not even gonna lie to you. I didn't finish the book because even in the beginning, I was like, this is helping a lot. And it did help a lot. You, <laughs> you was, you know what your book did that was, that was the most helpful. So, because in the past couple of years, it's been like a lot more mainstream. People are like, oh, so people think the clit is just this one little dot, but it's actually this like spider thing that goes all around. <laughs> and everyone was like, do you know what a clit actually looks like? And I'm like, yeah, bitch, I've known since 2013, dude. All right. <laughs> I've known since more than some of you guys knew. But I remember when I saw that, it really helped me kind of understand like, all right, there's a, there's, it's, it's all over the place. Like you can, but that's right. That's right. The clitoris responds to persistent, consistent stimulation of the vulva. And like the penis that grows outward, you have to remember, men and women, we are formed from the same tissue, the yeah. same embryonic material. It all exists to be used and nothing gets discarded or wasted. So just as penises grow outward, clitorises really grow inward mm -hmm. and there's so much um sensitive tissue and nerve fiber that really um kind of wraps around pretty much the 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 surface of the vulva extending inwards around the first third of the vagina yeah and so vaginal stimulation can be very very pleasurable especially in combination with direct mm -hmm. clitoral stimulation of the vulva um, but so you can combine really intense external with internal stimulation to create a lot of, um, pleasure. A lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think a lot of dudes don't understand that because we are just built like it's, it's very much, you don't need a manual to figure out what to do. You know, right. you know, it's interesting though, Dylan, you said that like, um, it's so taboo for men. You're right. Um, I find that there are two kinds of female readers of She Comes First. Mm -hmm. No, I actually find two types of women come into my practice in terms of their points of view around oral sex. Some women are very much like, I want more direct clitoral stimulation. I want more satisfying sex. Mm -hmm. You know, um, unfortunately, most intercourse positions really don't stimulate the vulva externally and don't yeah. stimulate the clitoris. And there's a, what would be called a clitoro-vaginal distance between the glands of the clitoris, what most men would identify as the clit. 
mm-hmm. and the vaginal entrance, there's a gap of uh, a distance yeah, yeah, yeah. of like Co- three to five inches. centimeters, oh, a couple centimeters. of inches. Yeah. Right. And depending upon that distance, that can really make huge differences in how intercourse feels. Oh, doable. okay. Um, so a lot of women come in wanting better sex, wanting more clitoral stimulation, uh, wanting more oral sex or using sex toys or, um, and then a lot of women come in sort of feeling like, whoa, like intercourse is one thing, but having a guy go down on me uh, requires a lot of extra vulnerability. Yeah, women feel a lot more vulnerable when that's done to them than dudes do on the opposite. Exactly, exactly. Women, well, I think isn't this about like how women have been historically body shamed so much more than men? Yeah, for sure. About their bodies. So of course that body shame extends to genital self-esteem. How is my vulva going to taste? How does it look? Yes. How does it? Mal, does he really want to be doing this? Like those are uh-huh. all going that- on in their head, which are going to prevent them from enjoying it. And I also will say, I just think dudes are grosser, so we don't really give a shit. So it's like <laughs> uh, we're like, yeah, go down. I don't give a shit. Blah blah blah. Where like women are going to be more aware and at least thinking of that stuff. Where the guys, we're already turned off, and we're like, my dick's hard. Put it somewhere, you know. And and it's frozen. <laughs> There we go. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, Sorry about the freezing. I don't know if that's on my end. Or uh, you never know. And you know what? It's probably for the best that we don't because then you would just be like, oh, I'm yeah. fucking up or they're yeah. fucking up. Yeah, so they're, but so the, there's different women that are trying to figure out how to be more comfortable with that. Uh, and the reasons, I think, are, are pretty easy, like you said, to point out and to understand. But I'm I'm still curious why as men there's such a taboo with us doing it and why it's even been portrayed as like emasculine or so tell me a little bit more about that and what you're experiencing. Has that been has I've that heard been people like, say that uh, you've it's it was definitely a thing in Italian culture, not with me, but you've heard like uh people talk about it. I've heard dudes be like, oh, that that's like kind of makes you a bitch, or why are you gonna go de-? like there's I, you've definitely, I've definitely heard that, and I, maybe it's a power thing, but I've always kind of thought it was like more of a. I always thought of it as more manly to do because then at the end of the day, like you're you're doing even more, and you get to at the end, like you don't want to be, you don't want to be, because uh, if you really get it, you want to be like, oh, you have to come and all this shit. But like, if you're doing that, it's going to be more likely that you do and you're going to be more like successful and can make sure that your partner is like happier and do all that stuff. So to me, it always felt like the manlier, smarter thing to do. It always, it, to me, it always came out of, which you can, can kind of understand, it always came out of necessity and as another tool belt to make sure that honestly, I didn't feel as shitty as about, about the intercourse that probably wasn't going to be good. <laughs> Yeah. The only thing I regret about my work, and and I actually don't regret that much because like I'm all about mutual pleasure. I'm Mm -hmm. all about clitoral stimulation. I think that there is this sort of orgasm gap that comes up a lot around intercourse. So I'm really all about promoting clitoracy and outer course. And I actually believe that uh, we should care about mutual pleasure for our partners Mm -hmm. and want to make that happen. Um, the only thing that I'm a little regretful about my work is I would never want men to use she comes first in like a macho way to be like, here's how great I am at making a woman come. Or mm-hmm. I would hate for a woman to also feel pressure to orgasm. Yeah, they already have enough of that. Because a guy has that expectation. What? They already have enough of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I'd hate like, you know, for a woman to feel like, oh, like, he read She Comes First and now suddenly like I'm like this orgasm object that needs to come for him, you know? Yeah, I, I um, you know, I'm not going to say that that hasn't happened, but I think it's it's pretty on the low percentage of where that where well, it went to. But wait, and when you read the book, it really came out of my own dysfunction and my yeah. own the low sexual self-esteem. For sure. You know, um, so. You know, I, I just I don't want it to ever get like sort of co-opted as like part no, no, of like no. the game or something like that. Oh my god, know? the game! I forgot about that. You know, it's really <laughs> funny. The one dude that that talked to me about the game in high school, 
I remember he came, it was like, it was our sophomore year and he came to class and he was explaining how he had read the game and about how like you need to wear something on your wrist, like to flashy, to catch the girl's attention, all this shit. And he was, and he was trying so hard to tell me like the exact way to get a girl. Five years later, he comes out, he's like the gayest dude I know. And I was like, <laughs> okay. I was like, that's kind of uh, interesting. Yeah, I, I never understood uh, any of that or any of those psychological tactics or I think it comes rules, from these, you know. It's like from guys who are trying to embrace that seeking side, you know, but they're looking at it like, you know, as literally the game, like they're trying to do it like sports where it isn't really, I think the biggest thing is just understanding kind of like what you had spoken about earlier, which is we like as men generally a lot of times we can have that initial uh metabolizing of a lustful thought and wanting to get it whereas for a female most of the time if this is a hetero relationship like you got to kind of build to it you got to have little cues there has to be this whole thing that allows them to get there and i think a lot of guys don't get that yeah and then i think a lot of guys also like dylan i have so many men in my practice or that I come across who like once they once things are starting to get a little familiar and predictable they don't know how to blend in some unpleasant some newness and so for them the only way they know how to get psychological sexual stimulation is really through cheating you know or going yeah. off into like internet porn and chat rooms and paid sex and i have nothing against internet porn chat rooms or paid sex but you did like sort of bring up like the challenge of like how do you still find your partner sexy or mm -hmm. how do you still get those cues out of a long-term relationship what is it by taking time out with each other or trying out something new you know yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that there's like um, an unobvious answer. But again, for me, I would say like what has been the secret of like my ongoing sexual pleasure coming from a place of total sexual dysfunction? Mm -hmm. How did I end up in a good place? Well, I picked someone that I'm really attracted to. And that attraction just continues. I mean, my body changes as I age, her yeah. body changes as she ages. But you know what? There's still some kind of core chemistry that was there and is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, like I said, like we have what I call the sex script or the sexual environment. It really works and it's not pressure based. I'm not worried or thinking about my performance. Like we have a sex script that we can turn to that's actually relaxing. It's meditative. It's mm -hmm. really arousing. And then you add on to that some psychological stimulation. You embrace talking about fantasy or you embrace watching or reading things that are sexy or you go out into the world and you do something that's a little mm -hmm. novel or sexual. It's not yeah. tremendous. Steal someone's to car playing, together. Yeah. You know, I to go off and like become polyamorous. Not that yeah. I could, yes, but, um, you know, like, so it's sort of like these having these different levels, mm -hmm. you know, having that level of attraction, having that level of comfort and communication, and then having a level of newness or novelty that you can sort of like layer in. And I don't know, for me, it all works together. It's kept me going. It's a, a very uh, synergistic. That's the word I was thinking of. Synergistic relationship. Okay. Is it, you, would, uh, you would also, um, before we finish up, like, why do you there, you you talk about the the sex recession that you would I think you you were you were in an article about it or you had written about no you were in an article from Cosmo about it and the person that wrote the article I'm not gonna lie a little bit was kind of annoying but the part about you was good was they were saying that there's this talk of a sex recession and it is self reported that millennial for millennials that millennials are having more sex but it's like we're enjoying it or being more. Um, uh, we're, we're taking more charge with it, but do, like, have you, with your clients or who you deal with, or just as a growing man who you've talked to, do you feel like there's anything pointing you to like, this is why millennials are 
having more having less sex especially with the right. t- there's we there's this hookup culture and we have apps dude like i could go on an app right now and probably at least hit someone up that it might work out with i never had anything close to that yeah I had to be like in a room on my own i know it sounds no horrible shit. i'm so sorry <laughs> like and i'm so bad at breaking the ice or getting oh to know man yeah like me that, too that app. although i probably would have just spent all my time on that app and got nothing else done in my life yeah it's distracting um, um so i didn't write that article on the sex recession yes. i didn't do the research i believe it was written in the atlantic i know it's a very thoroughly thought through and researched and thoughtful piece mm-hmm. i know it's controversial but i remember the writer really put years of research into thinking about the piece and percolating the piece so i know that there's a lot in there i didn't write the piece though and i probably just going off of my practice Mm -hmm. here in new york or the lecturing that i do i probably wouldn't have observed like what i would have called a sex recession yeah um you know i would have observed that like a lot more people are able to enjoy solo pleasure, men and yeah. women, without being like weird anxious about, it. about it. Yeah. Um, um, what else would I? Uh, what else? A lot of people are able to enjoy sexual relationships that might not be counted as sex if you're only looking at sexual intercourse. Yeah. True. So whether we're looking at like oral sex, hooking up without intercourse mutual masturbation things you know remote sex we're seeing a lot of now Mm -hmm. you know during covid so i wouldn't point to um a sex recession in that sense maybe less intercourse happening but maybe not but again dylan though i think what i would say though is I do notice a lot more anxiety around sex amongst young people yeah. than, than I ever experienced. Or um, there is a lot more um, masturbation happening that's being fueled, I think, just by you know easy access to porn. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just something I, I, I observe. Um, but there is so much to it that it could lead towards like a a – imagining of sex that is not truthful right 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 yeah and and a lot more so so i guess i guess what i'm noticing which is interesting i haven't thought about it this way is like a lot more sort of comfort and resources to be sexual with yourself Mm -hmm. vibrators sex toys yeah chat rooms even paid sex opportunities, although I'll, I'll keep that sort of up, and a lot of sexual anxiety around actual sex with a person, especially as it, as you said, as it starts to have some some kind of stake, like oh, do I really want to be here, or shit, I really want to be here, and now I'm really nervous because I'm really here because I really do want to be here. I really want to be with this person. Yeah. Uh, am I going to be, you know, the right kind of lover? Yeah. And you know, it might like going off of what you were saying, it might even be that people now are so good at knowing what makes them feel comfortable and at ease and what they want that when they're in a situation where they can even sense that they might not get that, it's easier for them to know, oh, I don't like this. This doesn't work for me. And then to lead them down the pathway of like, this might not be as good. Whereas before, when you weren't able to fully be with yourself, you just had to go out there and figure it out because it was either that or you just weren't getting laid, you know? Right. Do you think people are really able to like almost pick the sex they want from a menu and they know the menu they're looking for? And if that somebody's not on that menu in some way, they can feel like, oh, I'll just go to the next person? Well, it's I think it's impossible to know what someone will be like sexually until you're with them. So I think you can't, pick from that until you have been with that person. However, I think because of, for me personally, the more partners you've had, the more you know what you like and what you don't like, and the more you can kind of spot it very quickly. And has nothing, there's nothing wrong to do with that person. It's just, you guys don't don't sync up, you know? So I think that might lead to a lot more uh, one or two encounters because you go, yeah, this probably isn't going to, link up so it's not maybe like a menu per se but you go like oh yeah this has something that 
if you want to use right. that analogy. Yeah, this is an ingredient that I know I'm not a fan of, and I've tried to like peppercorns. I don't like peppercorns, so I see that this person has peppercorns in them. I'm good. We like right. nothing to do wrong with them. So I think to a certain degree, there's a little bit more uh, personalization, which is good, yeah. but can be frustrating because you're like, oh, this is like that. I know I don't like that. Damn. All right. Got to find, you know. Yeah. I don't know. There's also no fun in sort of just getting exactly what you think you want. Yeah. Okay. True. Right. Like I always loved about sex, like, Finding the attraction, the unknown. Uh -huh. Who is this person? What are they going to offer? And like, I've never done wow, this before. Never done this, or they're totally different looking, or yeah, yeah. seen than I would ever want. And um, let me ask you a question, Dylan. Mm. What do you think? If I'm just working on your gut response, like, yeah, living in this age of like a lot of for men especially and women, just so much access to porn. Mm -hmm. What do you think, if anything, are the effects of porn on the actual sex lives of, uh, of, of, of younger people today, millennials, let's say? Well, I stopped watching it because I thought it was affecting me um, with other people. And I think I was right because I remember being in sexual situations and imagining it looking like a POV video. It has to look this good, like the lighting has to – and then that's not how people look in real life. You know what I mean? They're not going to – and and in the video, you feel like it's all – that like in the video, the person is fully into you because that's their job. They're acting. They're full. So if you don't see that, it might not – now that I think about it now, I think I was expecting a attraction or um, enthusiasm that might not always be there when you're first with someone. I don't know if I necessarily think it's bad for a lot of dudes I know, but I've talked to multiple dudes who are like, I think I, sh I think I should stop watching porn or I think I should at least pull back from it. And I think if anything, as guys, we get down this rabbit hole of being like, what's OK, we already watched this. What's a weirder thing to watch and what's a and I think that can affect you a little bit in just being desensitized to just being with someone that you like and are attracted to. If you aren't at least aware of, mm -hmm. I'm just going off and doing this, and I know that's not what I'm going to get in real life, you know? Right. So you think it could lead to um, the development of a set of expectations that starts to almost become part of your sexual temperament. 100%. It yes. gets replicated so often mm -hmm. that uh, these expectations really get internalized. And so what you're doing by stopping watching porn yes. is sort of decoupling, trying to sort of vacate those Pull expectations yes. to get back to some sort of more authentic sense sexual. of your own sexual self. Yeah, because, you know, you're we're, we're creatures of habit. So if you're used to watching the – when I was doing it, you know the videos you like. You know the actresses you like. So you go to that video. You watch it. Your body goes, oh, I know what this is. I'm in this habit and then all of those things start to switch on and it leads to those I, – I, I forget the word, but it's like the pathways that they, it, all, it all just plays out. So, okay, I want to ask you, do you think there's benefits? You talked about some of the negatives. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's benefits as well to like – To watch important. Just, again, you know, like I didn't grow up – like I work with guys now. You mm -hmm. said you're 29? 27, yeah. 27. So I don't think I've met a 27-year-old who has had a voluntary, non-porn-based masturbatory ejaculation. These are guys who have had wet dreams, nocturnal omissions. But I don't think I've met, like, rare is the 27-year-old guy I've met who, when it comes to masturbating, will be like, I'm just going to use my imagination. Or yeah. I'm going to think about that girl I had sex with two weeks ago. Well, number one, now you have. And number two... <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's – look, I, th I think positives about it can be um, if you're someone that thinks too much or has a lot of anxiety or, or whatever, it allows you to completely be distracted and focus on that. So you're you're in it and it is that time that you're present and watching whatever that is. Are you saying during sex you can I'm go saying, to – I'm something? saying during – I was saying – you were asking what's a positive of it, and are you, you're asking for a positive from watching porn that relates to during intercourse? 
Well, any you know, we've been focusing on the negative. In mm-hmm. fact, I just gave you what can sound like a negative. I don't deal with men who use their own erotic imagination. So it's so easy to talk about the negative. It's like an interesting exercise. Like maybe there's some positive uh, positives to it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to because I'm I'm a pretty optimist, optimistic guy. So I think I should be able to, if there is one, find a find a positive. I would say. Uh, number one, it depends on the type of porn you're watching because uh, if you're watching something that's like pretty disrespectful, don't know if that's going to be positive to your female partner unless, but then again, there's people that like that. So yeah, you know what? If you're with someone that, okay, oh, okay. I found one. Here we go. Yeah, I think you might be in the same. Let's say you, <laughs> you <laughs> let's say you start hooking up with someone that says that they're into BDSM, all right? Or something like that. You've never done that before. So I'll just say me. So me, Dylan, I've never done that before. But I really like this girl, and I want to do my best to fulfill her, to give her pleasure, and I'm a little excited by it. But instead of me going in raw and never having done it before with her, I do a little bit of experimentation. I do some research. I go to those websites. I watch some different videos, enough so that I have a couple tricks up my sleeve. I've seen people do it do it well, I would say, because they're doing it for a big audience. So then when I come, I feel confident, I feel ready, and then I lay it down. There we okay. go. So it's a little like an educational tool. Yes. For for certain kinks like that, I would say. For normal right. sex, I don't really think it's educational. I think that leads to men doing what I've heard multiple women call jackhammering, which they think is good. And uh, I luckily had a girlfriend that was like, that doesn't feel good for me at all. And so I never did it again. But I think a lot of dudes will watch that sex because porn is so male centric and for the male gaze that they go like, oh, this looks good. This is what I'm seeing. The girl seems to be having a good time. She's probably not half the time. That's interesting. I read some Pornhub data, like Pornhub publishes all of this data. Yeah. uh, Based on people's trends. And uh, one year, I forgot which year, but I think... um, lesbian porn was the number one choice for women masturbating on their own. Straight oh, yeah. Women my my girlfriend did that. Yeah, my ex-girlfriend did. And I that think, and, and when you drill down, it's because there's so much more accurate clitoral stimulation yes. than there would be uh, in heterosexual. Oh, porn. yeah. It's, it's probably but what, what about, it is. What about, what about watching porn with a partner? Can that be valuable? I think that can be valuable if you're trying to see what the other person likes, um, if you enjoy seeing that person get aroused. However, I had it where it was very negative because the girl I was with didn't like the kind of shit I liked, got upset at me, we got in a fight about it, which I think can happen with it, which is one of the negatives yeah. that everyone knows that that can happen with. But yeah, it could be positive. You could see- yeah, but so she went to a, she went to like a, a self-esteem place or like- yes. Jealousy, upset. Yeah, you, you 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 like that, so you must not like me. Yeah, or you yeah, like or like or you're an idiot. About- How do you like this? Or like right. this? Because right. you know, some porn can feel kind of weird. I think here's what it is. Um, it was a it was a, a while ago. I think it was like a casting couch type of video, right. and I think she was like, "You like that these girls don't know that they're getting into the." You know what I mean? So she was like, that's kind of weird. And then I was like, well, wait, I'm not a, and then it just became this because accusatory kind of thing, you know? Right. See, but that could have happened. What I would say is, yeah, I like the fantasy of that. I'm not saying I'm going to go out and be one of these casting directors, but I like- assault a woman, yeah. But I like the fantasy of that kind of uh, hookup or that kind of thing. Like, I would worry about your girl, that woman not- whoever she was, mm-hmm. also judging you for anything you might like that's different. There was judgment she- for sure. We were we were in a um, immature relationship in our early 20s, and uh, we learned a lot of things. We pushed through it. But yeah, we both had some issues surrounding that, and um, me not being fully o- emotionally available, and you know, that's a whole nother... Uh, a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother <laughs> talk. But yeah, I think though there can be benefits to it but i think guys can get obsessive and and with so much choice they can lock on to one thing so you have to at least i just think you're you know, we're aware of all of our different habits and how you know 
don't drink to excess. Don't whatever, you know? So if you're watching porn, know what kind of porn you like. Know that it's good. and know that it can be helpful. But don't drink three six-packs worth of porn in one day, you know? Don't right. hurt your sexual liver, if you want to call it, at least to, to an extent. And yeah, if you want to use it for educational for certain things i think it can definitely be helpful but i do think as a guy asking a girl what kind of porn you like and even maybe like for actually for both people in the relationship i think it could be helpful if you were completely open to go show me what you watch and not in a judgmental way but just to see this is what turns that person on okay how can i incorporate that right like i work with guys dylan who their partners are like, what do you fantasize about? Or guys will tell me, I have no fantasies. I don't have any fantasies. And then when you start to talk about the porn they watch, oh, they have fantasies. <laughs> because they turn to one kind of porn, yep. or one erotic theme, or one clip. And in that world, there's a world of fantasy. True. But I think, so. okay, so because there's like that stepmom, stepsister porn, right? I don't think right. a lot of guys are watching that wishing they could hook up with their stepsister or stepmom. I th- so I don't know if yeah. it's the that exact fantasy. What would you think with that? Well, you know, that whole thing is like they call it uh faux-cest, F-A-U-X yes. because it's not can obviously nobody's depicting real incest. Yes. And I've talked to some performers and producers who say that's basically just a quick way of taking any generic clip mm-hmm. and trying to make it hot or palatable. Right? Yeah. So you have the same actress showing up as stepsis. In the next video, it could be the same video, and she could be showing up as the MILF. You know, like oh, okay. they're literally trying to take generic clips and just label it with some kind of a uh, A little caption. bit of a taboo. Yeah, okay. And a buzzword. A little bit of a taboo. A little bit of a buzzword for SEO purposes and a <laughs> taboo. So I would say that we are attracted to the taboo. We are attracted Mm -hmm. to like the idea of something could be naughty or wrong. Yes. And it's probably also because there's a lot more divorced uh, parents these days. So you're at least around that more. Yeah. And we do live in more blended families and, uh, you know, I I think, um, I think taboos do speak to, to desires that, Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily – listen, there's a a difference between a thought, an urge, and a behavior. And I think we're way too hard where we might – where we should sometimes be hard on sexual behaviors, Mm -hmm. especially ones that are harmful or non-consensual, absolutely have to be hard on sexual behaviors. I think that we can be um, easier on ourselves about the kinds of sexual thoughts that come into mind and turn us on. Especially because maybe that – would prevent them from leading to a behavior. If you were able to talk about it and dissect it a little bit, then that person might feel more okay with it and then potentially understand it's not good compared to internalizing it and then turning it into a behavior that's detrimental and harmful. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Oh, shit. So gotta yeah, you got to go. go. And, yep. I was, I was like, we're, let's end on that. This was fun. Awesome. Ian, this was great, man. Thank you so much. Uh, she Comes First is the book. Bye. He's got a bunch of other books that I'm sure are all great. And he's got a shit ton of articles on his website that you can go through and read. I've read a couple of them. They're great. It's iankerner.com, right? That's right. And I have a new book coming out in April. So maybe we'll reconnect oh, for that. I would love to. Awesome. Have a good rest of the day, Ian. Thanks so much, man. Take care. See ya. Bye.